General Motors. Let's remember, coming out of World War II, the biggest automobile company in the world control a third or 40% of, uh, of the car market in the United States, expanding in the world, taking over Opel in Europe, and, and on. It, it was on top of everything. It, uh, it's a defunct, it's a shell of itself now. It's a company that, that collapsed, is taken, owned by the government right now. It, it, it assembled the highest paid, best advisors in <laughs> Merrill Lynch, the biggest stockbroker in America, had his fingers in every town and you know, nothing. It's a subsidiary of the Bank of America. Nothing. So being under control, making decisions, they really know what they're doing. No, they don't. They make the best decision they can. They're subject to many more. If, if you go to a boardroom, I've done this a few times in my life in big corporations, they're the first ones to tell you, we can control, this is their language, we can control these many variables. They like to sound mathematic. But there are many more variables that will determine the outcome, and we don't have control over those. So one of the most important skills we can develop among our managers is the ability to understand that lots of things are going to happen for which we had no plan and no expectation, and you have to be flexible and that's how they talk. But it is a kind of grudging recognition that, yes, they make plans, and yes, they try, but they, like you and I, are subject to all kinds of political, cultural, economic complexities that can make Toyota succeed and General Motors collapse. That's the way it is. Merrill Lynch is gone. Wachovia is gone. Wells Fargo is here. But don't count on that either. They'll disappear too. It's not under control. Corporations are, are now moving out of the United States to get to this question because that's the best shot they think for them to survive. They have to produce elsewhere because the American society hasn't been broken down enough to make it profitable to stay here. The wages are not low enough yet. The constraints on what they can do are not few enough yet, but they're counting on centrist Democrats and Republicans to accelerate the process, and that's their position. You want us to stay here? Make it worth our while. And the same thing goes with the market. The market is not growing here. The market is growing elsewhere, so American corporations are going to go there. By the way, they know there are risks in that. There are no guarantees, but it's the best they can figure out to do, and we're going to live with the consequences good, bad, or indifferent, of the gambles they're making. I again remind you, we're going to live with the results of the gambles a tiny number of people are making for doing what's in their interest in terms of profit and business growth. For us to believe that what they do for their interest will in some magical way end up being the best for all of us is a level of gullibility we should have outgrown around age six. <laughs> but some people haven't. You all know, or you should, the history of economics, my discipline. We celebrate as the founder of economics a deeply religious man, a professor of religious studies named, that's what he was, Adam Smith. He needed to come up with a theory to explain how it might be that if every individual economic actor, businessman or woman, worker, banker, if each one is concerned only to secure their own personal immediate interest, it will somehow work out. The man was a deeply faith-driven person. If each of us does what's just good for us, it will end up being the best for everybody. It will be as if God, he was a religious man, took each and every one of us by the hand 
and led us to so define our individual interests that it produced the best for everybody. It would, if you remember the phrase, it's as if we were all led by an invisible hand to do, okay, this is a charming idea, but it really is a pretty thin rationale for businesses to do exactly what they want, for the rest of us to believe that that's the best outcome we can get. Maybe that was good in the 100 years that the United States rose as an economic power. It doesn't ring anything other than hollow now. And so we should outgrow. Recognize it for the charming image it was, but not to take that seriously. It really is an, a variation of trickle-down economics. I'm going to take some liberties interpreting our final question. You began the talk by identifying yourself as a Marxist. Yeah. Uh, when it came to the prescriptive part of your talk, you talked about the importance of democratic worker control over the firm. As inspiration, you cited an agreement between the steelworkers and an anarcho-syndicalist organization in Spain. The question is, what do you think of the economic theories of Noam Chomsky, which I'm going to reframe as... Professor Wolf, are you changing your colors from red to black? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's way too late in my life uh, for such things. No, I'm, I'm a red. Um, and I should mention, and I'm trying to use my facial expressions as part of this, I am a happy Marxist. <laughs> ah, I don't apologize or retreat or anything. I understand that among the people who call themselves Marxists, there are people I have no interest in or connection to that I disagree with. But any of you, those of you who call yourself, I don't know, Christian or Jew or Republican or Democrat have the same caveat that you have to articulate. So with that behind me, no, no, no. I, I don't imagine that this is all going to work out because little groups of people do something and then it'll magically come together. Now, I believe we need strong, well-developed organizations. I'm not against organization. I am not an anarchist. I, I understand that there's an impulse behind anarchism to be critical of the state, and to be critical of institutions. That part I like. But I, I take seriously that we face a, a capitalism that is not about to disappear, that is not about to go home and admit that it hasn't worked out real well and give us a chance. It's not gonna do that. It's gonna utilize all of its organizational means to confront us with obstacles and difficulties or worse. And it would be naive and irresponsible, I think, for those of us on the left to imagine without organization that we can be a credible alternative. So no, that's one of the reasons I gave you the example of what's happening in Europe. They are making a struggle against austerity because they have organizations. That's what's allowing them to do it. That's the network and the, the skeleton around which people think politically. That's our problem in the United States. Europeans understand, not all of them of course, but in a much greater number than here. You don't solve a social problem with an individual solution. You need a social solution and a social movement to win a social solution. And they see those organizations, not uncritically, they have all their criticisms of them, but they see the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the Green Party, the trade unions, and so on, as important institutions with all their differences that can allow social expression. So that a worker in, in France, it's a country I know best because my family comes from there, that a worker in France thinks of the trade union and the socialist and communist parties as important ways of expressing his or her upset with what's going on, a way to change the direction of society. Sure, you take individual steps for your own needs and crises, but you don't stop with that. You also want, need, and respect organization, the need to support it, to sustain it. Organizations are flowers that need nurturance and watering and care and respect. Americans have been taught much too much that an organization is a danger, a threat, a fearful thing that will take away your precious individuality. 
We're a country obsessed by individuality, and we go into a McDonald's that looks exactly the same in Seattle as it does in Scarsdale. We all wear the same jeans. It's extraordinary, the, the split mentality we have, but it doesn't mean that that isn't an important impediment. And we have to come up, we have to find a way as a nation to understand and respect organizations or else we will only be occasional nice folks, including professors, giving talks. And that's only a small part of what has to happen and what all of you have to do. So let me thank you again for coming. Let's thank Professor Richard Wolf.